It's official. Davidoff is no longer a Cuban cigar brand. Cuban Davidoffs are no longer allowed to be sold in Davidoff shops, and that's that. But Davidoff, being the businessman he was, having dealt with the Cubans for so many years, and probably in his own interest, maybe he said, you know what, it's time to get out, decided let's move production of the brand, and had already moved it in 1990 to the Dominican Republic. By the time all of this went through, Dominican Davidoffs were already on the market. Now, we're going to go and take a look at Davidoff today. But before we do, I just want to close on the life of Zeno Davidoff and make a few comments on a few interesting things I picked up along the way. Zeno Davidoff passed away at the age of 87 in 1994. The cigar industry lost, whether you want to think a great man or not, definitely lost somebody who contributed a hell of a lot to the industry, especially image-wise. You know, before Davidoff, you know, depending on what you read and what country's history you're looking at, cigars can be said to have been uh, an object of wealth because, yeah, tobacco is always expensive, uh, not like today, but, you know, it was expensive. But in a lot of places, tobacco smoking was frowned upon, you know, and there were even bans in countries long ago before you know, what we see today, like, you know, there were bans in smoking in certain places, smoking indoors, it's always, it's always been an ongoing thing. Perhaps one could say that cigars have never been at that level, that pinnacle of the good life image as they were until Davidoff put his promotional and marketing insight into the realm. Um especially with the creation of the Chateau series, something that would change the way people looked at cigars for a long, long time, up until now even, and I want to make a point of that. You know, before that, cigars were cigars. There were brands, there were, you know, different Vitolas, hundreds of brands, thousands of Vitolas. Special production, limited production, stuff like that, not so much. You know, if if at all. And the Chateau series under the Hoyo de Monterey label can really be looked at something as one of the first, say, Grand Reservas or something of that nature, almost. Um, now, whether how influential his mind was in creating the brand, whether it was like he said, all his idea, or whether it was like Cuba Tobacco said, their idea and the idea of the distributor Durr, we may never know exactly, but he definitely had some influence in that very, very, very important turning point for Cuban cigars and cigars as a whole. As a man, you know, I guess I was thinking to myself, you know, here's a guy, dapper in a suit and everything, businessman, but when you look at him in another light, you know, he's setting bonfires to hundreds of thousands of cigars, he's putting already trademarked names on cigars before even telling the other companies and then sending them a box and saying, ta-da, here's what I've done, hope you like it. I mean, he certain, certain some of his practices were def definitely unorthodox as far as proper business procedure goes, but is that really any different from so many of the corporate leaders we see out there today? No, no. And compared to some of the people out there today, what he did was really nothing. I would say lighting a bonfire to 100, that's a little manic, don't you think? That's a little, that's a little manic right there. But I think it was uh, that his, his special personality, um, in a way, that led so much to the cigar industry. being said, Davidoff may be gone, but the Davidoff name lives on through the Ottinger Davidoff Group, all under the watchful eye of master blender Hendrik Kellner. So if you like the blends, that's who you have to thank for it.
Now, now the Davidoff name is not owned by the Ottinger Davidoff Group exclusively, because in 2006, Imperial Tobacco paid 368 million pounds, or the equivalent of over 600 million U.S. dollars, just for the Davidoff name on the cigarette line. They have a very large and expanding, ever-expanding cigarette line. We sold a, a ton of those in, in our shop. Now, that's a big chunk of change just to pay for Davidoff cigarettes. So what do they have in mind? I don't know. It, here's the thing. Here's the funny British twist. British Imperial Tobacco that bought out the Davidoff cigarette line for 600 million plus dollars is the same British Imperial Tobacco that bought out Altatus S.A.'s 50% share stake in Habanos S.A. in 2008. They paid an exorbitant amount of money for that. In fact, I have it right here, British Imperial Tobacco, 12.6 billion euros, rough, roughly 16.5 billion U.S. dollars for the company. That's a lot of money. Do I, I, <laughs> February 2008, Talit, the fifth largest tobacco company. That, okay, that's it. In February 2008, British Imperial Tobacco acquired Altatus, the world's fifth largest tobacco company that had a 50% stake in Habanos S.A., BIT paid over 12.6 billion euros. That right? 16.5 billion US dollars? I wonder if I have that number right. I, it's getting too late to go check now, but that sounds like an insane amount of money. Either way, that's not the point. The point is that a company that has a 50% stake in Habanos SA also owns part of the Davidoff name. So, the Davidoff name is still closer to Cuban cigars than a lot of people may think. Now, does that mean we're going to see any Cuban Davidoffs in the future ever re-released? I'm not going to say no. Here's the thing. Davidoff is not around anymore. British Imperial Tobacco already owns a big chunk of Davidoff, the entire cigarette line. Now, I would definitely say that the Dominican Davidoffs would have to go bye-bye for Cuba to even consider re-establishing the name. But if Habanos S.A. thinks it's something that would make them a fortune, which in a lot of aspects, I mean... Now, what would happen if Cuban Davidoffs were ever re-released? You know? I think a lot of people would say, oh, it's a bunch of bullshit because Davidoff's not even around. Okay, yeah, but then you could just say Monte Cristo is a bunch of bullshit because Alonzo Menendez is not around. You know what I mean? In fact, that's true about, well, I wouldn't say every, I, I would think every Cuban cigar company. I mean, even Cohiba. Eduardo Rivera, I think he might still be alive and kicking. But Avelina Lara is not. You know, uh, whoever created the most recent brands, bland, bre blends like San Cristobal, for instance, they may still be around. Whoever did that, um... But for the most part, all of the cigars you're buying, these are blends made by people a long, long time ago who are gone. And there's really only one cigar company, and that is Habanos S.A. slash Tabacuba working hand in hand, you know, as sales and production, respectively. So it's an interesting concept. I mean, I guess you could say they they still know the blend they take the old blend and remake it and start selling cuban davidoffs again who knows what the future holds just an interesting thought time to move on ah one last thing i wanted to mention and this is a little this is an interesting little bit of history because once we get into the uh dominican republic side of things it's mostly just going to be about the lines that are out there and what kind of blends they're using and then we'll be wrapping it up with our last third and our final rating. Uh, but I want to talk a little a bit about one of those names that we use not as much but very often like Winston Churchill or like Churchill when we refer to a cigar. And that name is Rothschild. Let's talk a little bit about this. You go into a cigar shop, especially when you're brand new, 
one of the first things that hits you is all the different names of the Vitolas. You see Churchill, and that's one of the first ones that everybody learns. Well, it's called Churchill because it's named after the same size of cigar that Winston Churchill often smoked, which was apparently Romeo and Juliet in number two, but I've heard and I think I believe that he smoked other cigars, other brands, same size, but mostly people say the Romeo and Juliet in number two, which was a 7x47, seven 7-inch by, 7 by 47 ring gauge cigar. A Churchill. You'll see the name Rothschild used a lot. We say Rothschild. Technically, it would be Rothschild. Rothschild, if you're referring, because it comes from the same place that Davidoff got his Grand Chateau series from, French Bordeaux wines. Remember when I said that the Dechem, the whole Dechem incident that went down, the Chateau Dechem, the wine company got really pissed off that Davidoff used his used their name for his cigars, caused a whole big incident, had to yank him from the market. Well, those were replaced by the Chateau, I believe it was the Mouton, yes, the Chateau Mouton Rothschild. Now, that cigar was the first, the first cigar to be named Rothschild or Rothschild. So you go into a cigar shop and just like you asked why are all these cigars called Churchill and the guy behind the counter told you, you ask why are all these cigars called Rothschild and he tells you oh they're named after Rothschild. Who the fuck is Rothschild? <laughs> you know? Or some guy will be a little more technical and say named after Baron Rothschild. A little better. But it's, it's technically true, but not really because where does the name really come from? It's only named after Rothschild because Davidoff brought the name into the cigar market. It's not like in the instance of Winston Churchill where Churchill smoked these size cigars and they named them Rothschild, uh, Churchill's because of that. Rothschild maybe smoked cigars, but they didn't name Rothschild size cigars Rothschild because Baron Rothschild somewhere was smoking that size. Who is Rothschild? Mayor Amschel Rothschild. Rothschild is a German surname and it means red shield. That doesn't matter so much, just a little bit of trivia. Mayor Amschel Rothschild is known today as the founding father of international finance. Through five sons, he established an international banking chain, corporation, institution, whatever you may want to call it. And by the 19th century, the family held what is known today as the largest private, privately held fortune in modern world history. Extremely, extremely wealthy people. A lot of that wealth has been distributed now through so many different uh, sons and daughters and families via inheritance. Five of the lines of the family were classified as nobility by either Austrian or British royalty. Uh, and hence, you'll see sometimes uh, names like, for instance, in Macanudo, Baron de Rothschild. But that's not why. Why is because of Davidoff. Remember when I told you that the uh, about the whole Chateau de Chem inst uh, incident when the wine company confronted Davidoff and saying, you're stealing our name, we want you to stop, caused a whole big incident. With That's when everything started to fall apart at the seams. It, it started there between Davidoff and Cuba Tobacco. Now, of course, they had to relinquish that the use of that name but then another cigar popped up, the Chateau Mutang Rothschild. Now, why did that pop up? Because in 1853, Nathaniel de Rothschild purchased a French Bordeaux wine company and renamed it Chateau Mutang Rothschild, or Rothschild if you're referring to the French wine. And then, that's not all, in 1868, James Mayer Rothschild purchased another French wine company, Chateau Lafitte 
which was already a Davidoff brand name, and renamed it Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Funny thing is, in 1983, when Davidoff replaced Chateau de Cam with Chateau Mouton Rothschild, he also changed the name of his Chateau Lafitte cigar to Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Why he did that? Well, it probably had to do with some sort of dealing that when he lost Decam, he went out and said, I need, an, I need another company. And he probably decided on, well, he definitely decided on Chateau Mouton Rothschild. But once, you know, Rothschilds being who they were, and he, who knows what, maybe he contacted him first, maybe he did the same thing again, sent him a box and said, hey, your name is in the market of cigars. Either way, I think they probably got back to him and said, sure, would you mind using our other uh, Bordeaux wine, our other chateau, uh, for your cigars as well, and he renamed Chateau Lafitte to Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, both in 1983, the Mouton Rothschild and the Lafitte Rothschild. That is the first use of Rothschild within the cigar industry. It wasn't until later that Americanized cigars began using the Rothschild name. There are no other Cuban cigars called Rothschild. Rothschild is not a Cuban Vitola. It's an Americanized Vitola that was taken from the Davidoff Chateau series, just like Chateau was taken from that series. That's where all those fancy names started. That's the point I'm trying to get across. So next time somebody asks you, well, why is it called Rothschild? Blow their minds. Because it's not just because some guy Rothschild smoked that size cigar. It's a lot more than that. So very, 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 very technically, Rothschild is called that because of Davidoff's dealings with the Rothschild family and the naming of two different cigars after the French Bordeaux wines Chateau Lafitte Rothschild and Chateau Mouton Rothschild. That is the story. So... Our cigar is getting short. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about Dominican Davidoffs, and from there, wrap it up with our final rating, our th the last third and our final rating. Say goodnight, Max.